Um, so uh, this is Dr. Jill Turner. She uh, was kind enough to come. I, I called in. I don't know what favor I had to call in, but I, I called it in. So uh, we actually went to undergrad together, and we, uh, uh, as I was giving my ecstasy, she was apparently taking her post-mortem temperatures rectally. <laughs> so awkward. Literally. <laughs> Not the place to be if you were a mouse, just, just in general. But uh, Dr. Turner graduated at WVU in 2002, good year for graduates. Yeah. Uh, and then she uh, went to Georgetown to get her PhD in neuroscience, and then spent uh, the next like five years at uh, uh, UPenn as a postdoc. And then she started at MUSC's uh, College of, not MUSC, sorry, it's USC's okay. College of Pharmacy in 2014. And she's going to talk about stuff I don't understand, which is uh, the genetics kind of behind smoking addiction, mm -hmm. I think. So, again, I'm a simple chemist. <laughs> Even chemists smoke. You yeah, so. have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thanks, Brian, for such a nice introduction. Um, I had a really nice day coming and chatting and meeting with all of you guys. I had lunch with some really interesting students, even a drop-in that wasn't really invited, but that's totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a really nice time talking to all of the different faculty here today. It's nice to hear about some of the neuroscience and et cetera that's going on. And the chemist even doing a little neuroscience with some UV receptor stuff. So, Brian, you lied to me. I told him, I said, okay, I have two different talks. I have one that's like real broad, good for intro, and, and I have one that's like real science. He, I'm like, which one do you want? He's like, oh, we want real science. So as we go along, I'm going to be giving you the cliff's notes to what this is. I'm just warning you. But it was uh, uh, Brian's fault if it's too complex. Don't nix me on it because the person who runs Embry is my chair's wife, and she'll come find me. So. <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit, and I've told Brian actually that this is one of the first times I've given this talk. So you're going to see all sorts of new data I've never shown before, as well as um, the first time I've actually gone through it. So usually I have a very polished type of talk. This one might be a little bit not so polished, more rough, gemstone-y type deal. Okay. So if it does, just let me know. Also, I have, I have a very like uh, um, relaxed style, so if you have a question, never stupid, you know. I'll spring out with all these neuroscience words, just stop me, ask me what it is, and I'll be sure to clarify, okay? So today I'm going to go over why kids can't quit, right? The idea is, is that people who start smoking during adolescence have a 30% higher vulnerability for addiction to cigarettes and to other drugs of abuse later in life. And they can't quit, unlike even the rest of the people who start after, say, 22 or later, okay? Now, what I do is I do a lot of pharmacogenomics trying to understand what the differences are that change in people during adolescence that then map onto their experience as adults, okay? Now, over here, anybody know who that is? Mark Twain. I love this quote. Giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world because I've done it thousands of times. <laughs> so who smokes? Oh, it's bad to say that now, don't you? Yeah, so one brave soul puts up a little tiny finger up here in the front. Who used to smoke or has ever smoked in their entire lives? There we go. So, you know, there's a term for what most people are now. Very few people are pack-a-day smokers. Most people are called chippers. What they do is, you know, they go out, play a game of pool, have a few beers, smoke a cigarette, but they don't really smoke, you know. They just smoke when they drink or with their friends. They're chippers. So we're trying to actually figure out that's a whole another science question, but it's always fun. So who's a chipper? Uh, no one's even willing to show that one. All right, that's fine. So here's what I do in my lab. I have two major areas of interest. One's the pharmacogenomic analysis of nicotine dependence, so looking at drug by gene effects and nicotine dependence and comorbid disorders. I've been really focused in on schizophrenia and ADHD recently, but I'm also interested in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cancer. Um, the other portion of my lab, uh, I have one graduate student that maintains course on this project, is on gliotransmitter effects. So the brain is made up of a couple of different types of cells. You have neurons that talk to each other, right? 
So you have this neuron releasing neurotransmitters that then this neuron listens to and hears, and that basically forms a circuit that lets you think, drive, do stupid things when you're in college, whatever. But in, in addition to neurons, you also have astrocytes and microglia, okay? Astrocytes were used to be called the glue of the brain. They thought they didn't do anything but husbandry type stuff, but that's absolutely not true. They modulate the way that neurons talk to each other, and microglia lets of fungus are actually from your mother's placenta and migrate up into the brain and are your brain's white blood cells, basically. So those are your three types, okay? However, even though that's really interesting, I'm not speaking about that at all today. I'm talking mostly about this. So I'm funded by NIDA, which means that I am obliged to have this in all of my talks, saying that smoking is really bad. <laughs> and it is. I mean, you can only concede. It's about 50 years ago, the U.S. Surgeon General report came out with uh, smoking health, showed that actually, you know, it's really bad. But even though it's been that long, smoking causes almost 90% of lung cancer deaths, a third of all other cancer deaths, and increases the failure rate of treatment. So if you continue to smoke while being treated for cancer, your treatment success goes down by a third. However, very few medical doctors ever treat smoking, smoking with smoking cessation agents during cancer treatment because they figure, well, you're already here. The worst has already happened. Right? That's not true. So even though it's been 50 years, one in five Americans continue to smoke. And even though majority of them want to quit, less than 5% are able. So what do we do? We're interested in why there's such a low success rate of quitters, okay? So here's a little bit of a biology schematic on how addiction works. This is true for nicotine, for cocaine, heroin, shoe shopping, all sorts of things, okay? What you have is you have an initial drug exposure in an individual, and a subset of people that has that, they then escalate to chronic use. At which point, they get shamed into quitting, typically is how it happens, you know? At that point, they go through this cycle that really doesn't stop for the rest of their lives between cessation, withdrawal, and relapse, okay? Now, because nicotine is an illicit drug, the majority of people that we see are always in this withdrawal cycle, right? They, you don't, people don't come into my office and say, I want to learn how not to start smoking, right? They're always coming up and they're like, hey, I'm a smoker. I've tried to quit five times on my own. How do I do it together, right? So I study majority of my time cessation, absence, withdrawal, and relapse, and what impacts that. Now, a new project in my lab, though, has been interested in this. When people acquire addiction via adolescence, they become much more dependent upon the drug and it's much harder for them to quit, okay? So our question is, is if you were exposed during adolescent, adolescence, how does that impact your later life experience in terms of cessation, withdrawal, and relapse? Now, I love this picture. Isn't this just like the most saddest, like, <laughs> <laughs> like policy kind of picture you've ever seen. It's like, oh, I just can't help myself. It's like, what, 12? I don't know. <laughs> but it's still a fun photo to show. So although the rate of smoking adolescence has gone down, so here's a nice little figure from the CDC. You can see since 2011, it's gone down from about 15%, less than 10%, right? However, the problem is, is that e-cigarettes have been going up and up and up. And actually... This year, it's been shown to be 20% higher than the rate of smoking was five years ago. The reason for this is the idea that it's harm reduction, right? There's no harm in it. It's only nicotine. It doesn't have all the carcinogens in it. You're not going to die from cancer, right? Well, yes. However, e-cig use promotes progression to cigarette smoking, JAMA, pediatrics. So, they, so unlike a person where it really is harm reduction, who's a smoker, and then goes and gets an e-cig and actually reduces their smoking intake, right? A kid gets started on e-cig and transfers over onto cigarettes. Completely the opposite of what we're trying to do. Additionally, as I mentioned, smoking during adolescence increases dependence by almost 30%. So this is an important problem, right? 
One reason we think that you have this increase in dependence is because the brain continues to grow and form synapses and develop until 26. Okay? You ever wonder why your insurance rates go way down when you hit 26? It's because the insurance company knows that your brain is finished developing at that point. And the part that's the last part to actually finish developing is the frontal areas. This is the part that's for executive control. This is the part that's important for um, inhibition, right? So for instance, the person who's 26 will probably not go 120 on the freeway, whereas the person who's 18 or 20 might, right? And it's because that area of the brain that controls this kind of behavior is still maturing, okay? All right. So prefrontal cortex is made up of a couple of different regions. I'm not gonna go over too many of those since do we, how, how many people have had sudden neuroscience in here? Like five, six, okay. So don't worry, it's just a whole bunch of random regions. Um, <laughs> but the one I want you to focus in on is this orbital frontal cortex right here. The orbital frontal cortex is named that because it's right behind your eyes. So orbital, right? And this is the portion that's really important for addiction but also, say in schizophrenia and ADHD, lots of any kind of disorders are gonna have compulsive or impulsive behaviors. This area is important for linking rewards and punishments with actions. So, you know, you put your hand in the fire, it gets burned, you don't have to do that anymore. That's over the frontal cortex, okay? Additionally, it's highly connected to both reward centers, so, Drugs of abuse, what happens is, is it increases the amount of dopamine in your brain. Dopamine is that thing that makes you feel good when you have chocolate, when you're in love, right? Well, drugs increase that same chemical. That's the reason why you don't eat as much chocolate or have as much in love feeling as when you're on drugs, I guess, right? The other area that's really highly connected with is the limbic areas. Now, amygdala and hippocampus, are really important for learning and memory, but emotionality as well. So these are the areas that are impacted during Alzheimer's disease, but also depression and anxiety, okay? So this is an area that's really well like positioned to have impacts during addiction, where you have disruptions in reward, as well as disruptions in affect and anxiety and um, uh, memory as well. <coughs> Additionally, there's been some data showing that adolescent nicotine um, given only during that, that early adolescent period results in changes in this brain structure, even if you look years later, okay? So my question is, is how is nicotine driving these changes in plasticity and perhaps increasing um, nicotine dependence as adults in these individuals? Okay. So I do, I do three big things in my lab. I do genetics, I do behavior, and I do electrophysiology. Electrophysiology is what the first half of this talk is. How about physics? Who does physics? Anybody? Yay, I got a physicist. Okay. <laughs> so let's start low. So the brain is a, an electric organ. Right? The main way that neurons talk to each other via neurotransmitters is by depolarization, basically the flow of ions from outside of the cell into the cell, depolarizing them and activating them to talk to the next neuron, okay? So by actually recording electrical currents in the brain, we have some idea of how the brain is functioning and how the circuits are changing, okay? So let's just go with I was measuring the electricity for now, okay. So long-term potentiation is what I was measuring in the orbitofrontal cortex. And long-term potentiation is considered the cellular basis of learning and memory. Now, if I was in a group, a room of neuroscientists, I would never ever say that. I would get grilled. <laughs> See, I got one person who knows. So it's just, because they really hate it when you say that. However, it is a very good, common way of explaining it to people who, who aren't used to looking at long-term potentiation. There is an old um, saying in neuroscience, cells that 
fire together, wire together. The idea that it's not any one cell by itself, but the way that the cells connect into a circuit that's important. Think of a computer, right? So when you inject a certain level of current into the circuits of the orbital frontal cortex, you can get those cells to fire at a certain rate. There's certain types of electrical current that they really like, and it makes them potentiate the response to where more cells fire, and that is long-term potentiation, okay? So here's their baseline responding. I give them this current that they really like, this frequency of electrical stimulation, then all of a sudden, they respond much higher, okay? Learning, let's say, okay? Now, when we do this in late adolescent animals, we find that we can get long-term potentiation. And nicotine in many brain regions is known to potentiate that, so we assume to just make it bigger, right? It go up more. Well, actually, it goes the complete opposite way. It turns into, it turns a stimulate, stimulatory uh, input into a depressing input and actually depresses the activity of this region. Now remember what I was talking about, this region is important for impulsivity and for decision making. So if nicotine basically shuts it down, well you got a lot of impulsive kids smoking even more, right? So what was really interesting is, is if we look at a full adult mouse, the LTP is gone, but so is the nicotine effect. So it's a very specific window of late adolescence that maps onto about the ages of 15 to 22, the same age of onset for the majority of schizophrenics, who also smoke a lot, by the way, that impacts this orbitofrontal cortex, right? So how's this happen? So one way we looked at this, GABA, I know we have some GABA fans here. So we were like, well, you know, if it's long-term depression, it's probably a break, right? So in the brain, you have two different kinds of big neurons. You have a gas, a glutamate, or you have a break, a GABA, okay? And then you have all these other neurotransmitters like acetylcholine and serotonin and stuff. They're kind of like gear shifts and things like that, right? But gas break. So I was like, well, let's see if the break is just on more. So I block the break, the GABA, with picrotoxin. And in fact, I can actually slightly and if I blocked both types of the receptors that GABA signals through, it completely occludes nicotine's effect. So it is a GABA-dependent effect. So how does this happen? We think that we have nicotine flowing in. Somehow, black box, it's increasing GABAergic transmission, and that results in reduced firing of the cells and LTD. So we're like, well, you know, what are some potential ways this might happen? When I was at Penn with my previous mentor, Julie, she and I uh, did some experiments trying to understand how nicotine and withdrawal change the way that genes in the brain are actually regulated, okay? To do this, we treated animals chronically with nicotine, withdrawal, and saline. We isolated the uh, pertinent parts of their brain and ran a chromatin immunoprecipitation. So we took out all the pieces of DNA along with all the proteins that were attached to it, okay? Once we had that, we then isolated all the DNA and sequenced it. Do um, you guys know how sequencing works? Yeah? Oh, so I can skip so I can see. Uh, my favorite part of the picture. That's all right. So, one of the biggest hits that we got from our sequencing was actually for this relatively unknown gene called neuregulin-3, okay? Neuregulin-3 was of interest to us because it had been highlighted in a handful of papers with GWAS indicating for both schizophrenia and ADHD, two diseases that have incredibly high rates of smoking. Schizophrenia, 80%. ADHD, almost half of them, right? I mean, your 18% is the regular baseline for America. So you're talking like eightfold higher in schizophrenia. So that sort of was like, hey, let's look into this. This might be an interesting molecule to examine. A little bit about this molecule. It's an epidermal growth factor-like molecule. And what it does is it binds um, specifically through 
the ERB4 receptor, which is the HER4 receptor. It's a major target for breast cancer, actually. And we know from previous research that the ERB4 receptor stimulation in the cortex where we're looking specifically increases GABAergic, that break signal, right? So is this the mechanism underlying our nicotine's effects in LTP, right? So to look at that, we then apply norregulin 3 onto our um, LTP paradigm, and it looks exactly like nicotine, right? So norregulin 3's effects are identical to nicotine. And if we block it with an antagonist or an inhibitor at the ERB4 receptor, which norregulin signals through, we can block that, that long-term depression effect as well, okay? So our next question was, though, so, yeah? Really quick. So in your initial things, it looked like yeah. your, your traces in response to nicotine started just at a lower level, right? And then potentiated, but it was, everything was just completely depressed. Mm, okay. Right. So uh, the the potentiation is the upswing right after the stimulus. And but it it's like that. it's it's so it's done in a way to where it's normalized to baseline. So even though it is, it, so this is uh, a your typical the, thing. The yeah. Baseline at the beginning is fine as well. So this is so this is where it is, right? So nicotine's okay. been on the slice for the last like forever. Right? Gotcha. And so it's always a 60% deficiency, basically. But, I'm sorry. So our question, though, is that whether we can actually block that with apatinum, with this inhibitor at the ERB4, mm -hmm. and, and you can actually do that, right? So if we, if we flow on the inhibitor for the ERB4 receptor, which norgan 3 signals through, you can block nicotine's effects, right? Now, a problem that you hit a lot of times in science is the um, both the norgan 3 peptide and apatinum can have nonspecific effects. Drugs are dirty, right? I mean, we know this. That's why you have to use a whole bunch of different drugs. Or, or you can use fun genetic knockouts. Um, although these are a lot harder than your cool little worms. Um, <laughs> so I wish, I wish my worms and stuff were um, easier. I have to buy these because I'm, I'm really bad at making mice. So my, we have an OFC selective knockout of ERB4. And what this is, is it's a flox mouse. So there's lox P sites on either side of the ERB4 gene that when you um, combine it with CRE or combinase, it actually excises the gene for you, right? Now for us, what we do is that we do site-specific injections only into the orbitofrontal cortex, so we're only excising it in that one brain region in the same the age of the animal that we're interested in. Okay, what we find is is that it still blocks both of our effects. If we then go on to a uh, spontaneous mutant mouse, this is the Norgenthus scaramaga mouse. It has a microcellulite repeat in exon seven of the Norgen three gene which is right here. Um, what it does is it actually truncates the norgan 3 protein and reduces its activity. And when we evaluate <laughs> these effects in that mouse, what we find is, is that, again here, there's no effect of ACSF or of nicotine. So now we have another model that we filled in a couple of the blanks. We think that nicotine flows in. It elicits norgan 3 activation and then subsequent downstream activation ERB4, which then impacts GABAergic release, similar to what previous studies have shown, and resulting in that LTD effect. But we were more curious about what was happening in this little black box between nicotinic receptors and organ 3 okay? So we knew that organ 3 is activated by base 1, which is the beta secretase. Beta secretases are important in Alzheimer's disease, um, you hear them a lot in any kind of dementia, actually. Um, but norgan 3 is actually cleaved by that beta secretase. And beta secretase is activated by increases in intracellular calcium levels. So to test this, we looked at adding ruthenium red, which blocks the ranadine receptor, and then basically blocking all intracellular calcium. And you can see that we have a blockade of the effect or attenuation. Similarly, if we add the LY compound, which is a base inhibitor, um, we also can attenuate this effect. So this would suggest to us that 
we actually do have this case where nicotine is coming in, increasing calcium release from intracellular calcium stores, activating base one cleavage in organ three, resulting in ERB4 stimulation and downstream GABAergic signaling. However, based on our data that shows that there's changes in late adolescence but not adulthood, you would assume that these molecules must be regulated during this time period, right? But what we find is, when we did, so I had a really talented undergraduate, Rachel, who trained with my graduate student, and she collected tissue from a number of different brain regions and ran qPCR for norregulin 3 or B4, base 1, and disc 1. And what she found was, is that specifically, during that 8 to 12 week change that we see from late adolescence to adulthood, you see a significant reduction in the expression levels of norregulin 3 and ERP4. So our question here was is that this might represent a molecular driver behind the loss of nicotine's effects in OFC plasticity, right? So up to this point, we know that nicotine has novel effects on OFC plasticity in the brain uh, in late adolescence. These effects are mediated through norregulin 3 ERP4 signaling and that both of these uh, proteins are developmentally regulated at this time point. So you can imagine the situation where nicotine exposure during adolescence results in increased in organ free signaling during the critical late adolescent period, and resulting in increased nicotine dependence later in life, increased for other comorbid de developmental disorders. So how do we approach treatment for smokers when the problem began so long ago, right? Well, <sighs> I want to show you a schematic from some of our clinical trial data. What we found is that it doesn't matter what drug you're on, whether it's placebo, nicotine replacement therapy, or bupropion. In the first 72 hours, this is a survival curve, in the first 72 hours, over half of all individuals relapse after a quit attempt. It means our drugs suck for lack of a better word. So, but why do people relapse right here, right? Nicotine withdrawal drives relapse. Individuals go through uh, very severe symptoms when trying to quit smoking. They go through impairments in cognition and concentration. They go through depression and anxiety when they try to quit smoking. All of these things impact relapsed smoking. And this is a reason why a lot of times they can't quit, right? Additionally, we have a drug on the market that's not that bad. A lot of people have actually successfully quit on it. It's uh, Chantix. And Chantix is good at helping the craving, that feeling that you just kind of want a drug. But it's really bad at concentration and depression. So what happens is, is that these other withdrawal symptoms actually impact adherence to treatment. So they stop taking their drugs because it doesn't help this stuff, right? And they relapse back to smoking. Now, as I mentioned, part of my lab, we do behavior in animals that we then try to extrapolate to people. Preclinical paradigms, we have a couple of different paradigms of cognition, including fear conditioning, spatial object, novel object recognition. I can go over those. We have models of depression, um, forced swim test. Literally, you dunk a mouse into a tank. It's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> you also have a tail suspension test, where you hang the mouse upside down by its tail and measure how much it struggles. And these aren't actually models of depression, I just want to add. Basically, if you give an SSRI, the animals have, there's efficacy in their behavior here. So it's more of an output in their behavior rather than a, um, an actual model of depression. But what I'm going to talk about mostly today are models of anxiety. I'm going to talk about two of them, marble bearing tests and the novelty induced hypophagia test. So in our novelty induced hypophagia test, it's a really fun uh, assay. Most of all my students love to do it. Literally, you have a little tray of peanut butter chips and you give it to a mouse every day for 10 days. And mice love, you know those little Reese's chips that you feed? that you like cook and bake with and stuff. So my students love it because it's just fun feeding mice, I guess. But then 
after you treat them, after you get them trained to actually they'll eat the food. Because little known fact, there's a reason. So rodents don't have an area for strama. It's an area in your midbrain. It's basically your vomit center. So when you eat something really bad for you, you expel a mesis, right? Well, rats and mice don't have that center. So what happens is, is that if they eat something bad for them, it's going to kill them, they just die. So they're very, very careful about what they eat. So, <laughs> so it sounds kind of odd. I have to train them to eat a highly palatable food, but that's the reason why. Okay? Then I treat them with uh, osmotic, with nicotine for about two weeks. After this, I put them into the home environment again. I, some of my animals, I take out uh, the mini pump, so it's 24 hour withdrawal. And then I put them into the novel environment the next day. Novel environments here, it's big, it's bright, it smells different, I wipe it down with pine salt. And I present, <laughs> I present the food in this environment. And what happens is, is the animal takes a lot longer to go and actually eat it. The reason is because it's anxiety provoking, right? They're scanning their environment to make sure that nothing bad's going to happen instead of just eating the food. The reason why this test is fine is because you can get the effects of both anxiolytic and anxiogenic drugs in this task. Okay? So for instance, here you can see on our home day one, there's no effect of treatment. But you can see in saline treated animals that your novel environment has a massive effect. You go up to 200 seconds instead of just like less than 10. However, in animals have been treated chronically with nicotine, you have an anxiolytic effect, means less anxiety-like behavior. And then during 24 hours withdrawal, you see an increase, right? <laughs> now we use this in conjunction with Neuragon 3 scaramaga mice, those mice that have that truncated, non-functional version of Neuragon 3. What we find in their control litter mates is that they have your normal anxiolytic effects of nicotine, anxiogenic effects of withdrawal. However, in our Scaramaga animals, while they still have the anxiolytic effects of nicotine, the withdrawal effect is completely absent, right? So if you don't have an irregular three, you don't present with anxiety-like behavior during withdrawal, okay? Additionally, we also use our drug, the apatinib compound that inhibits ERB4, that receptor that neuron three signals through. And we find that actually the same thing. So in our controls, you can see nicotine is anxiolytic, withdrawal is anxiogenic. But if you treat during withdrawal with apatinib either 10 or 20 mg per kg, you actually can um, preclude that withdrawal effect. Now, the other task that we're discussing today is the marble bearing task. This one is pretty much also what it sounds like. You have about a cage that's got about five inches, five centimeters of bedding, and you put marbles on top of it, like in the picture. Pop a mouse in there, and mice, when they're anxious, their automatic response is to burrow. They just burrow to the end, okay? So what happens is, is that if they're not anxious, they don't bury as many marbles, right? So here's our Neurine 3, this is the NIH data I showed you. Similar in, in the marble bearing task, they also have a reduced number of marbles that they bury. For the apatinib, it's similar as well. Here's nicotine, here's withdrawal. The low dose of apatinib and the higher dose can also preclude that response, okay? So, going from adolescent to adult, what can we think about these behaviors and how nicotine might interact with the, this molecule, right? So we know that blocking the 3 or before can prevent nicotine withdrawal-induced anxiety and this is perhaps due to increased signaling. So we also know that, in, that uh, after chronic treatment with nicotine or withdrawal, you have a significant induction of mRNA for neuron 3 and protein, I'm not showing it here, and or before. And if this would co-occur during that period of late adolescence, where you're actually supposed to be having a reduction in these molecules, would this underlie the added vulnerability that we see in nicotine dependent comorbid developmental disorders. So finally, could this be true in humans, right? Well, you can do this two ways. You can do a prospective study where you enroll smokers with a known genotype, give them some kind of experimental design, 
test for smoking cessation expressed success, but you're going to have a smaller N. It's only going to be around like max 300, 400 people. Or you can do a retrospective study where you assess smoking status and mine for associations between genotype and phenotype. In these cases, you're on the span of thousands of people. Okay. So first, I'm going to show you some data from our prospective study. What we find is that this is a study that we enrolled in. Our data was, we actually replicated it because we were afraid to be wrong the first time out. So discovery cohort was one experiment and replication was the second time. You can see demographics, same average number of men and women, same college graduates, mean age is about the same, um, cigarettes per day, about a pack a day. Um, FTND is the Fagerstrom's test for nicotine dependence. Um, this is really interesting uh, professor over in the UK developed this, but basically the higher number, the higher your dependence level. And the experiment dealt with a, a pretty quick counseling session where we set a target quit date. Then eight weeks later, uh, you have nicotine uh, patch therapy. And what we asked at the end was, is whether or not they can maintain abstinence, okay? So SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? It's one spot in your genome where you're different from a lot of other people, right? Well, this SNP, which is, has a beautiful name of RS1896506, <coughs> just rolls off the tongue. Um, has, so this SNP in the regular three, if a person has an A allele at this site, their smoking success rate is cut by half. This is true at eight weeks, and it's also true at six months. Now, more to the point, though, for adolescents, because we don't have the background idea for adolescent history in the prospective studies. But for retrospective studies, we can get this, right? So these are going to be examining gene, uh, drug by gene effects and comorbid disorders such as schizophrenia or ADHD. And to do this, I work with a, a close friend and collaborator, Anna Lokola, who's at the University of Helsinki. And right now, the NIH, just started the ABCD program. It's this huge project, longitudinal, prospective, thousands of people starting out at like age, you know, 11, right? Looking for development disorders, it's a huge amount of money. It just started last year. Hats off to the Finns. They started in 1974. They had all of this data and knew all of it. And it's an amazing plethora of information, right? So 74 to, to investigate genetic and environmental risk factors. They have about 5,500 families of twins, so it's twins, parents, and sibs, right? They participate in about four or five ways of questionnaires, <coughs> also cotton swabs or DNA collection, and it's at ages 11, 14, 17, 22, and 35. And the next one's actually coming up soon. I think it's like 46, I guess. It's almost every 10 years. So. When I asked my friend, Anu, to cross-reference the idea of adolescent smoking, right, and SNPs, not only in Oregon 3, but just in this general pathway, right, and whether or not it maps onto problems with smoking cessation as an adult, what she found was, is that indeed, SNPs in Oregon 3 did this, but also ERB4, also base 1, also gamma secretase, which is important for some of the downstream signaling I've heard before. So SNPs in all four of these mapped onto adolescent use of nicotine and subsequent abuse and liability and hard uh, withdrawal symptoms as an adult. What we found especially interesting was is that some of the same exact SNPs that we identified for smoking have been identified in schizophrenia and shown to increase in organ 3. Because that would be a hypothesis, right? Since you block neuron 3, you block all these withdrawal effects. So there's been studies shown that some of these in schizophrenics increase the expression. Okay. So, promise we're almost done. I see some yawns. Sometimes I go a little slow. Apologies. So, coming full circle, nicotine has novel effects on osteoplasticity and late adolescent brain. These effects are modulated by ERB4, neurogen 3 signaling. 
Norian 3 and ERB4 down regulated during adolescence, but chronic nicotine can actually increase their expression. And SNPs in the Norian 3 gene map onto adolescent smoking rates and future dependency. So an updated model would say that nicotine exposure during adolescence, especially if you have one of those Norian 3 variants, would increase even higher that Norian 3 expression during late, that critical late adolescent phase and increase nicotine dependence later in life and risk for comorbid disorders. Okay. So our takeaway would be that late adolescence represents this critical period where exposure to nicotine can alter plasticine OMC and predispose people for higher rates of dependence. So that sounds really depressing. And after I got that one, I was like, I need to do a future step. So it actually sounds like we can try to fix it. I don't know. So, because right now it's looking pretty dismal, right? If your genetics are against you and you have the bad luck to choose to smoke, you're just sort of done, right? But <laughs> I don't think so. So right now what we're doing is, is that a mouse, I'm trying to look at how the chronic effects of nicotine during adolescence affect the regulatory signaling, and I'm looking at ways to reverse it. And we're looking at possible therapeutics, inhibitors of ERB4, of course I mentioned, ERB4 is HER4, which is a target for cancer. However, trying to treat smoking dependence with a chemotherapeutic agent usually doesn't work because um, it's worse than it is with smoke. So, uh, but downstream targets include PI3 kinase, which has actually had some promise in the schizophrenia field. Um, so we're sort of looking at that. In human, we're looking for um, uh, evidence of adolescent nicotine use and comorbidity with other other disorders. So we might be able to sort of tease apart via other disorders drugs that might be applicable for smoking dependency in people with these SNPs, right? Because we've got drugs for ADHD. Interestingly, a lot of them are nicotinic in nature. We've got drugs for schizophrenia, not very good ones, but they're there. So maybe we can sort of apply what's known in other fields onto smoking cessation. So my acknowledgement slide. Um, up here is my postdoc and my lovely graduate student, Miranda. Um, my postdoc did all the wonderful electrophysiology. Miranda did pretty much everything else. Uh, along with Rachel Lamalafont, my undergraduate, who is now at Temple for uh, an MD. <clears throat> also my collaborator, Pavel Artinsky. Also my husband. I don't usually snuggle with my collaborators quite like that. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Anu, from, that did a lot of the really cool uh, genetic studies. Okay. So uh, thank you for your attention. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free. probably just falls out in the statistics. So most of these have an N of anywhere between 12 and 16 or so. For animals, you really have to sort of do that, because especially with behavioral assays, you have a lot of variability. Um, but I think it's just following the statistics there. However, what's interesting is, is that that was a cute, that was a cute um, delivery right there. Chronic and acute looks exactly the same for those antagonists. And based upon my synaptic physiology data, I would have thought you'd have to give it chronically to get that. But no. Weird, huh? So yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, have you done any immunolocalization uh, with any of yeah. the research you've done? Uh, you got my Achilles heel. Oh, good. I'm okay. really horrible at microscopes. They break when I walk in the room. <laughs> I mean, quite literally. Like, I just gave up on it. I have, actually, Miranda is attempting to do some of that, but I just try not to go in the room when she's doing it. <laughs> um, there's been some lovely work by Lynn May and others. He's at Georgia Regions. It's called something else now. I don't, I don't know what it's called anymore. They keep changing the name. It's down in um, Augusta, Georgia, I guess. But he did some lovely work showing uh, localization of these, along with uh, Andre Bonanno, who's up at NIH. And so I've been sort of basing their localization on their work. 
And they show that ERB4 is typically always in inner neurons, those, those GABAergic neurons. But neurodulin 3 can be on any number of different cells. Mm -hmm. So truthfully, though, we are trying to do that. But I'm That's just, always really nice to see. That's, you know, when you have all the molecular data, mm -hmm. and this is mostly mRNA. You said you had some protein. That's you correct. Show it. Yeah. So that's like having the immunolocalization seems like it'd be like the nail in the coffin. No, you know? it would be. It would be Maybe really nice. Maybe I should nice. use that metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, another question is uh, for you is, uh, is, is this, this is a broad, Got kind of a broad question. Do you, does this um, modulation that occurs in the adolescent versus the mature brain, do we see kind of parallels between other types of, of, of drugs, say with THC? Um, you know, is there yeah. is is there more is a, is a person more likely to right. be addicted? I mean, it's one of these are these generalized kind of stereotypes. So, patterns. so that is a phenomenal question. Um, however. I don't think that that's true. So stimulants such as cocaine, methamphetamine, et cetera, they go directly at your dopamine transporter and just shoot dopamine back out. And that's how, why they're addictive. Um, morphine, on the other hand, goes from your opiate receptors, which is, is usually modulating tone, sort of like what nicotinic receptors does. So morphine, because of the role it plays, may be more like nicotine. Cannabinoid receptors are a little bit everywhere and do a little bit of everything. Um, they have both direct effects and indirect effects. And so maybe it's like this, but I'm not certain. Um, nicotine is one of those really unusual things to where in the peripheral nervous system has direct effects to where like you release acetylcholine, it binds to your postsynaptic cell, it depolarizes it and it goes, right? The brain, there is no postsynaptic nicotinic receptor signaling at all. It's all presynaptic modulation of other neurotransmitters, which is the reason why I think a lot of this is kind of particular to nicotine. But, you know, especially with morphine and cannabis, I don't know. We were just chatting um, actually early today about the reason why there's such a dearth of research and, uh, and marijuana research. So. It's, a, it, it's actually a political question. Um, back in the 70s, when the war on drugs started, they made a Schedule One drug. Cocaine is not a Schedule One drug, it's Schedule Two. I can get cocaine easier than I can get cannabis for research. The only other thing that's on Schedule One is heroin. Not even fentanyl, right? This is ridiculous. So what the myth, though, is, is that no one has done anything and cannabis research at all, up until the last couple of years. The reason is because since everybody's legalizing it, we don't have any information about it. We don't know how it works. So all of your questions, well, really interesting. Unfortunately, mechanistically, we don't know that. However, um, epidemiology would suggest that the whole idea of it being a gateway drug is actually probably true. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that I'm being taped. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it in post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, edit that one out, thanks. I have a question. Yeah. Um, for the adolescents who are smokers in your study, yeah. um, is, there, is there any observation about how long they were smoking before they were considered addicted, or what you know, the consumption rate was before you considered Yeah, yeah, addicted? yeah. You know, I don't know the answer. Um, I have to ask Anya. Maybe I'll, I'll get back to you. But it's one of those things where... She's a mathematician, so she just has all of this data and just loves it, right? Mm -hmm. So she just says, okay, yes, check. There's a box that they smoked at the 14, and then check, yes, they have a sniff here, and then check, yes, they have a sniff, you know, they, they smoke then again when they're adults, right? But I don't, I think that the data is probably available, but it's not data that she let me know about. But that's a good point. I'd like to see the, the 10, 11, 12 year old who always smokes a a cigarette every other day or mm -hmm. so, uh, who continues that for some period of time mm -hmm. may not actually become addicted for quite a while. Maybe, but you know, so. That just, so what you're seeing right here is acute nicotine on a naive brain. So who's to say that even like a couple of cigarettes a month doesn't do something? I because I'm not because I mean, especially now with the with the you know the all of the commercials against smoking, right? And it's really targeted towards adolescents. 
which is great, right? And we've actually done a really good job. I mean, you saw that. We've reduced smoking rates amongst the adolescents here. But, you know, even, I'm not certain that it needs to be a pack a day to really make that kind of effect later in life. But that's a, that's a question that we're going to be looking at, too. So for instance, actually, I can kind of answer that. So there's this guy, um, Hyde Mansvelder, who is in um, Amsterdam. And he's great because he's got a jerry coral. And he wears these, like, 70s polyester shiny things all the time. And he's this huge, like, you know, Danish guy. <laughs> and... I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him and he's telling me about this data where he injected an animal twice with nicotine during this time period and then he waited three months, which is basically an old mouse, right? And they had deficits in impulsivity and their brains were still all mucked up when he did electrophysiology. So actually I think I could probably say that it, I don't think it matters if it's a pack a day or just a little bit. I think it's pretty much... Sorry, guys. <laughs> I really sound like doomsday today, don't I? I don't, I'm not, I'm usually more upbeat. <laughs> I told Brian this is the first time I've done my adolescent talk, so I'm, not, I'm, this, I'm going to make sure the next time that it's not quite so gloom and doom. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, in your diagram, when you show the interaction between um, Neurons and uh, MRG receptor neurons. Mm -hmm. um, is there a feedback when you have GABA released to the presynaptic neurons that sort of reinforce uh, more release of uh, MRG? Great question. So, we are doing, well, my, my postdoc, brilliant, because she came up with the same question as you. Um, <laughs> she decided to do that idea to where you then block afatinib halfway through it to sort of see if you can, like if it needs the feed forward or if it just keeps going, right? And But we haven't gotten enough data to really say whether or not that's true yet. Um, but she does have some interesting data. So I have on there, it looks like, I don't know if you guys are, there's this whole like subculture of neuroscience that loves the idea of tonic neurotransmission, this bulk neurotransmission. You just have chemicals floating around your brain all the time. and slightly higher, slightly lower can actually really determine changes in your neurophysiology, right? So it's not where I'm describing where you have two neurons and one releases and the other one's like, oh, okay, and it starts doing stuff, right? It's more so like you just have this ambient level of neurotransmitter, okay? And that's thought to be due to reversal of the ion, the reuptake pump, okay? What we found is that this mechanism does not impact synaptic release of GABA, but it's actually that reuptake pump. It simply tinkers with it to increase that tonic level of GABA throughout the entire circuit. Whether that means that you need a feedback or not, I don't know, but I'm willing, usually when you're talking about bulk neurotransmitters, it is that kind of situation that you're describing. Well, thanks guys. Oh, do I have something else? No? Good. Okay. Thanks, guys. It was really lovely coming and chatting with you.